that God indeed created us to be with Him. What a blessing this is. Um, one of the most astonishing realities is that God in His goodness, according to His own sovereign plan, created and created us, human beings, after His image, according to His likeness, to be with Him, to enjoy fellowship with Him. And yet, our sin separates us from God. God created us to be with Him, but our sin breaks that fellowship. It's not someone else's sin, not merely Adam and Eve's sin. It's our sin that has broke fellowship between our hearts and God. We cannot have perfect fellowship with a holy God in our sinful condition, and there's nothing we can do about it. Thus, at this juncture, we want to recognize the hopelessness of the human state. For sin cannot be removed by our good deeds. There's nothing we can do to merit a relationship with God again. There's nothing we, we can do to erase or eradicate the sin that stands between our lives, our hearts, and our holy God. And yet, praise the Lord, paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Amen? So we meditated last week on this horrifying slash astonishing reality that Jesus' mangled body was nailed to a Roman cross as the object of open shame. The object of open shame. And there on the cross, God poured out his holy, righteous, just wrath upon his son, the second person of the Trinity, and Jesus absorbed it, exhausted it, pronounced that the atonement was finished, and then he was laid in the tomb for three days, declaring that he was indeed dead. But then he rose in triumph over it, in triumph over sin, in triumph over the grave, in victory, so that you and I could have forgiveness, so that you and I could be declared righteous before him, so that you and I could become sons of Abraham by faith, sons of Abraham by faith. And yet, the question we arrive at today is, who is this gospel for? Who is this atonement for? I recognize that that's a bit of a loaded question, along with a few others. For example, does Jesus have a type? Does God have a type? Are there people that are more likely to receive the message? of the cross? Are there people that you and I should prioritize because we deem them a little closer in our minds to salvation? Who is the gospel for? Is it for a particular race? Is it for a particular ethnicity? Is it for a particular country? Who is the gospel for? Here's a question. If Jesus when he hung on the cross and declared that the atonement was finished, when Jesus satisfied the wrath of God for sin, does that automatically remove the barrier for all people? Good question. You and I should logically think this through. So the question, who is this gospel for? Well, I have ultimately two answers uh, for you on this score this morning that I believe will be helpful for our minds and helpful for our hearts. But I want to get to those two answers by means of a text. So if you would take your Bible and go with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. We will follow really the life of Christ. There's no better person. to look at with regard to questions such as these than Jesus. By the way, as you turn, I recognize that some of these questions bring about a lot of theological debate within theological controversy. My aim this morning is not to solve theological controversy. My aim is to be helpful, to be theologically rich, Lord willing, for the, for the purpose of being helpful for the body of Christ. 
So let's look at the Bible, Luke chapter 18. We'll begin reading in verse 35. Again, this is the life of Jesus. It says, as he, this is Jesus, and his sort of apostolic band, his disciples, a number of other people likely as well that are following Jesus at this point, as he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. So just visualize this. This is Jesus Christ in the flesh, in his body, with his apostolic band, and he's traveling, and he is approaching this ancient city of Jericho, and there's this guy who's probably a a kind of fixture around this part of Israel's land, and he's blind, and he's begging. Verse 36, and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, and he cried out, notice with me what he says, He does not say Jesus of Nazareth. What does he say? He says, Jesus, son of David. He articulates a messianic title, attributing this to Jesus. What we're seeing here is that this man, this blind beggar, is recognizing something. He can't see Jesus with his own two eyes, but he's seeing something. My friends, he's seeing something. Jesus, son of David. Perhaps this Jesus of Nazareth is truly the Messiah. Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 39. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Now pause right here. Why did this group of people tell the blind beggar to be quiet? Literally, they say, shut up, man. This needs to to strike us a little bit. Would you just be quiet? Like, get out of Jesus' way. The question is, why did they say that? You don't need to answer me out loud, but I want you to think about it. What comes into your mind as you pause for a moment? What's a good answer? for this question as to why they say this to this man. I would suggest to you that the reason why these people instinctually tell this man to be quiet is because he's a nobody. Guys, he's a nobody who's a nuisance. He's just a problem. He doesn't contribute anything to society. This blind beggar He's always just sitting around, wanting a handout. That's all he's good for. He's not beneficial to us. He would not be beneficial to our apostolic band. He's just in the way. He's in the way. So, man, just be quiet. Give Jesus some space. Let Jesus by. But he won't be quiet. Check out your text. He cried out all the more, verse 39. He cried out all the more. I love this. He's passionate, and in fact, he again repeats this messianic title. Son of David, have mercy on me. And what does Jesus do? Verse 40, Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately, verse 43, he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. So this guy who is a nobody that's a nuisance to everyone, is suddenly able to see. He stands on his feet. He can now see where he's going to walk, and immediately he joins the apostolic band, right? He joins Jesus' followers there, and he's now part of the crowd that walks with Christ. Now, just incidentally, I will say to you, that had to have made for some awkward moments, right? (laughs) Because just a couple minutes ago, 
Some of those guys were going, shut up, man. Be quiet, man. And now he's a part of the group. (laughs) But that's what Jesus does, my friends. He was a nobody to them, but not to Christ. Now, let's continue reading. Where Jesus is up to something, my friends. He's up to something. Luke chapter 19. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So you can just imagine this guy, right? He's he's small. He can't see. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried, I always want to say scurried, and came down and received him joyfully. And, verse 7, when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Question, why do the people grumble? My friends, think it through. I'm not here just to give you all the answers, all right? Why did they grumble? Why did these people complain? Well, Zacchaeus is not a nobody. Zacchaeus is a somebody but he's a notorious somebody, right? This guy has prominence, he has some fame, he has a lot of wealth, and people hate him. For, if you know this story, you know that even embedded in this story is the reality that Zacchaeus is a crook. But he's not just a crook. This guy is a Jewish man who has kind of betrayed the Jewish people He's become a a turncoat of sorts. He's joined the Roman profession of collecting taxes, which was corrupt. Thus, this guy has feathered his own nest. He has built for himself a, a kind of empire there in the ancient city of Jericho. He's rich, he's wealthy, and he's gotten rich on the backs of his brothers and sisters in Israel. So people hate this guy. This guy has no morals. This guy has no loyalty whatsoever. He's a somebody, but he's a somebody that everyone hates. He's a problem. He is, like the blind beggar, a nuisance. Like, get this guy away from Jesus, right? He's way too far gone to be helped by Jesus. But Jesus goes straight to him. My friends, Jesus goes straight to him, and in doing so, he's making a point. The point is made clear in the text. Jesus is telling us something. He's declaring to us something. It's important for us to see. So note your text as it continues. Verse 7, they all grumbled about Jesus going to the house of a man who is a sinner. Verse 8, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, pause right here for a moment. We're not given all the detail of the conversation, all that happened inside of Zacchaeus' house. What we are given is the fruit of it. What clearly happens in Zacchaeus' house is that this man is born again. He's born again by Christ. So obvious because he says, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Zacchaeus is saying, I've been a crook, and I'm going to do my best to make it right. So in the space of a few minutes, this guy goes from uber wealthy to uber poor. I mean, think about it. Whoever I've defrauded, I'll, I'll restore it fourfold? Remarkable statement. And Jesus says, verse 9, today... Salvation has come to this house 
since he also is a son of Abraham. That statement is deep. Zacchaeus is ethnically Jewish, but what does Jesus mean by this? He's become a son of Abraham, and that has nothing to do with his ethnicity. It has everything to do with his faith. Jesus is saying, this man has believed. He's become a true son of Abraham. Now, the all-important line, Jesus brings this all together with a kind of mic drop statement in verse 10. For the Son of Man, and he's saying this, my friends, not only to Zacchaeus and not even only to all the people around that have been grumbling. Every time he does something like stopping to minister to Bartimaeus, this blind man, and now going to the house of a man who was a notorious sinner, Jesus says, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus is saying, these are the people I came for. This is why I'm here, to seek and save the lost. So, here you have in this moment a nobody who's a nuisance and a somebody who's a nuisance They're both problem. They're both people that his apostolic band instinctually think these are not the kind. If Jesus has a type, it's not them. Right? One we don't really want and the other that's too far gone. But what does Jesus show? He shows an entirely different thing. Amen? He shows us, watch me, the proclamation of the gospel is for everyone period. The proclamation of the gospel is for everyone. Now, all of this is made even more clear in the contrast. See the contrast. For the contrast is found as you look back in Luke chapter 18. Note it in your text. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 18, who do you find? Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 18, you find a guy who everyone would have instinctually thought, this is a good candidate to join the apostolic band. This is a good candidate. Why? He's young. He's healthy. He's wealthy. He's prominent. He's prosperous. Right? And cherry on top, he wants to go to heaven. Isn't this interesting? The rich young ruler, this guy who's got a place of position and power and authority, he's young, he's successful, he's wealthy, he could really help out the apostolic band quite a bit. This guy is a real candidate. And it's interesting, nobody's trying to shield Jesus from this guy. Isn't that interesting? The blind guy... Get away from Jesus. He's got stuff to do. Zacchaeus, why is he going there? The rich young ruler, let's give them some space. My friends, this is the context. The context. And by the way, both Luke and Mark do this. They put the rich young ruler right by Bartimaeus. And Jesus is telling us something. My friends, Jesus is telling us That the gospel is for sinners. That's who the gospel is for. The gospel is fundamentally for the lost. It is proclaimed to people who recognize that they're lost. So we should praise God this morning that it is, in Christ, unpredictable. It's unpredictable in our minds who will accept it. Isn't that true? Don't you see that here? It's unpredictable. You and I have no idea who Jesus' type is. He doesn't have a type. You guys tracking with us? So the gospel goes out to people indiscriminately. The proclamation of the gospel must go out from us to all people. 
regardless of race, culture, creed. Right? The gospel is available to all. So, praise the Lord, no one is too far gone, and no one is too unimportant. No one. So I would say to you, number one this morning, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is universally available. It's universally available. Though there's room for debate and discussion here, it's my opinion based upon these texts and texts that we will continue to see, that the atonement is unlimited in this way. The atonement is unlimited in its sufficiency, meaning the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the satisfaction of sin is sufficient, my friends, it is sufficient for sin, period. Thus, it is universally available. This is consistent with everything we see about the gospel in the Bible. First of all, it's consistent with the first pages of the Bible in the book of Genesis when God prophesies, promises that he will bless all nations through this one seed. That's what he says, Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, and then it's consistently portrayed throughout the Old Testament, and then into the New, that God is going to bless all peoples, all groups, all ethnicities, through the one seed. In fact, it starts that way, and the Bible closes that way. In the last few pages of the Bible, God gives to us a vision of a throne room around the resurrected Christ where there will be people gathered from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language singing, worthy is the Lamb. Amen? That's the picture we get. The gospel, my friends, the proclamation of it is for everyone. This is also consistent with Jesus' life. His preaching, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. He puts it out there, repent and believe the gospel. That's what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's an invitation. Whoever will come, come to me. It's also consistent with Christ's life. Christ would go after fishermen and preachers and lepers and adulterers and murderers and thieves and Pharisees. He pursued men and women and children. He held out his hands even to Jerusalem to say, I would receive you with tears. I would receive you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you refuse. This is the testimony of Christ. It's also consistent with apostolic preaching. We can look at the book of Acts. We're going to look at a few verses in a, in a few minutes about this with regard to the apostolic preaching to crowds, regardless of who's present, but also in the apostolic writing, in the epistles, texts like these. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, John writes, I'm writing these things to you. He's writing these things to the church. So that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, the satisfaction of wrath for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The atonement of Christ is sufficient, sufficient to send the gospel to the world. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Here Paul is commanding Timothy and the church there in Ephesus to pray for all the rulers. Pray for kings and emperors, right? Pray for everyone. This is good, he goes on to say, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself 
as a ransom for all. So Christ and his apostles unapologetically preach it to everybody with a legitimate invitation to come. I want to say to you that the gospel, my friends, is universally available. So how does that apply to us? It applies to us in multiple ways, but one that's on my heart and mind in this moment is that you and I, as a body of believers, we should not, hear me, should not have a type. As we seek to go out into the community where we live and go into our workplaces, spheres of influence, family, our heart and our mindset must be to share the gospel with anyone who will listen. To share it. You guys with me on this? To share it. The gospel call goes out to all people. So we must go after the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the healthy and the sick, just like Jesus did, the normal and the strange. Just like Jesus did, the moral and the immoral. Just like Jesus did, we must move toward everyone with the belief that he can save everyone. Amen? For, according to Christ here, it seems the only ultimate prerequisite for entry into the kingdom of God is that they must be a sinner. They must recognize that they are a sinner. For Jesus Christ, this is his text, verse 10, came to seek and save the lost. A couple of years ago, um, I got to meet a missionary, his name is Joel, uh, from Johannesburg, South Africa. And he was back in the States uh, for a brief furlough, and it was a joy to be able to meet he and his wife. And he told this story that just moved my heart. His ministry works a lot with orphanages and orphans there in South Africa, and they have become known uh, by the agencies there as people who will take uh, children that are rescued. There's so much trafficking going on in that region, and this little girl, this particular little girl was rescued. And so the agency immediately presented this case to the next in line, as it were. There was a family that had been waiting for some time to adopt a little girl. But when they came to meet this little girl, they pulled back the blanket and they realized that she had two club feet. And immediately this family rejected the girl. They wanted a baby girl, but not one with a deformity, not one that looked like that. So they called Joel. The agency called Joel. And immediately, he called the next in line. And this particular family had been waiting and praying for a baby girl. In fact, the mom had bought two little shoes, a pair of shoes, praying over those shoes for a baby girl's feet to fill them. And when they came to meet this little girl and realized that she had clubbed feet, they immediately rejoiced. They rejoiced. As I've thought about this the last couple of years several times, it moves me every time. Because here's the story. Actually, this family had been praying for a case just like this. What was her deformity, a cause for rejection in the first family, was almost a kind of prerequisite for the second. Because this family that had been praying for a baby girl had two biological sons, both of which had clubbed feet. Both of which. And so the deformity was the requirement. <laughs> the deformity was embraced 
by this family. My friends, you and I should rejoice. You and I should rejoice with a heart of praise that God came to seek and save the lost. Because in this story, if you and I are in Christ, we're the blind man and the crook. We are those who've recognized, I'm a sinner. Because God has awakened us, I'm a sinner. I am not whole. I am deformed in need of the great physician. And Jesus has reached down and saved your soul. Praise God. My friends, track with me. Praise God. His gospel goes out to everyone. And that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. So the gospel is universally available. But the gospel, secondly, and with this we arrive at an important tension, a beautiful and important tension. The gospel is also exclusively effectual. Or we might say it this way, it's narrowly applicable. In other words, all of this truth embedded in the gospel demands a response. So I will say to you, the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ satisfies the wrath of God for sin is not, is not automatically applied to all people. The Bible is very clear about that. In fact, Jesus himself says that broad, wide is the way that leads to destruction. The Bible is very clear that there are people, and many people, and this should break our hearts, but many people that are on their way to hell. That Christ's atonement is not covering them. Why? Because the gospel, though sufficient for all, demands a response. Everyone must come to the place where they recognize, I am a sinner. This contrast is made in Luke 18 and 19. For the blind man and Zacchaeus were readily willing to admit, I'm a sinner. I've been wrong. In fact, Zacchaeus demonstrates a beautiful example of repentance. I know I'm wrong. In fact, I want to make it right. Because God has made me right. Right? So he trusted in Christ alone, turning from his sin and turning from anything he thought previously might save him because he was simply a child of Abraham, perhaps, ethnically. Now he's recognized, I need Christ. I'm a sinner in desperate need of a Savior, but he responded, right? So in this way, I would say to you that the atonement is unquestionably limited. It is limited, for it is effectual. The atonement is effectual or applicable only to those who respond in repentant faith. I think it's helpful for us to think about it on this score in terms of redemption, and not at the transactional level, but at the relational level. That this whole story starts with God, starts with God pursuing us, coming after us in Christ to redeem for himself a people. I love what John Murray put in his book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, he puts it this way. If we concentrate on the thought of redemption, redemption, we shall be able perhaps to sense more readily the impossibility of universalizing the atonement. To make it this universal thing, that it's just automatically applied to all people. He goes on to say, what does redemption mean? It does not mean redeemability, that we are placed in a redeemable position Christ did not come to put men in a redeemable position, but to redeem to himself a people. So the gospel of the atonement is applied only to those that respond in repentance and faith. It requires a response. This is how the apostles preach. So see it on the screen, Acts chapter 2. By the way, this is also the instinct of every man, and you're going to see this here. This is the instinct. We know, we know we must respond to this. 
Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. Now, when they heard this, what did they hear? This is on the day of Pentecost. Peter is preaching the gospel. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What do we do with this? Right? They knew they, knew they needed to respond. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, so those who received his word, those who trusted in Christ alone, were baptized, publicly declaring that they indeed had trusted in Christ alone. Acts chapter 3, verses 17 through 20. And now, brothers, this is after Jesus, uh, yeah, Jesus uses Peter to heal the lame man. And people are gathering around, like, what's going on, right? Peter sees the opportunity to preach the gospel. He says, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance with regard to putting Christ to death, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled, repent, therefore. This is the gospel call. It goes out to everyone, but it calls men to repent, to recognize you can't save yourself. You can't save yourself. So turn to trust. Turn to believe. Trust in this Messiah, this provision of God for your sin. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Acts chapter 16. Verses 29 through 31, I know that for many this is perhaps obvious, but I think it's important for us to see this. My friends, see it again. The jailer called for lights and rushed in. This is a Roman jailer, right? He's been hearing the message of the gospel preached by Paul, sung by Paul and Silas. Earthquake comes. Paul convinces everyone to stay. Remarkable. What a salesman. <laughs> so trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Isn't this good? What must I do to be saved? He knew he needed to respond, and they said, You're already in, bro. Jesus paid it all. Is that what they said? You guys track with me. That's not what they say. They say, believe, believe. It's obvious he's repentant. Believe, trust. Christ alone can save you. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone. Here it is in a nutshell. Sufficient for all to everyone who believes. Romans chapter 10, Paul goes on to say, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All right, so John 1's already been read in your hearing. Would you turn there just briefly? John chapter 1. We're going to read together verses 9 through 13. See a beautiful truth. John says the true light, of course he's referencing Christ, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. This is in John's prologue. He's given to us a kind of summary of what the Christ would do. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but, oh, he clarifies, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. Here you see the distinction between those who have not received, those who have not accepted this gift, those who have not repented of their sin to trust in Christ alone, and those who have to those who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now note this phrase, who were born, 
not of blood, it's not about ethnicity, nor of the will of the flesh, not because you found him or willed your way there, nor of the will of man, but of God. We are born of God. So here we see this beautiful mystery that those who repent and believe, those who trust in Christ at the hearing of the gospel, Romans chapter 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word about Christ. Those who repent and believe are suddenly aware, my friends, please grab this, please track with this, are suddenly aware that this thing is much bigger than them. They are suddenly aware that God had been drawing them and awakening them before they ever knew it, my friends. God was at work to bring them to a place of repentant faith. Thus we understand the doctrine of election, that that all those who repent and believe the gospel were elected as such. And this, this, my friends, should cause us to worship This should cause us to stand in awe of the fact that God loved us and moved toward us before we ever moved toward him. Amen? So, the gospel is available to all. It's universally available. It's for everyone. But it's exclusive in its application to those who believe. And those who believe should not be proud of themselves. Those who believe should stand in awe, should stand in awe of a God who would choose to save them. Is this not wonderful, my friends? I love the lyrics of the hymn from the 1800s, which goes like this, I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew he moved my soul to seek him seeking me. It was not I that found, O Savior, true. No, I was found of thee. I find, I walk, I love, but, O, the whole of love is but my answer, Lord, to thee. For thou wast long beforehand with my soul. Always thou lovest me. What a Savior we have, my friends. Those who are in Christ should be able to marvel at the reality that he has given us the right. John chapter 1, he has given us the right to become children of God, for we have been born not of our will, but of his. That he has set us apart in the family of God. One way I've sought to illustrate this before to help us awaken to wonder and not just dive into controversy is with my own kids. I haven't done it as much recently, but especially when my kids were little, I used to say to them quite often, if dad could pick anyone to be his kids, who do you think dad would pick? And the first couple times I did that, I even kind of primed the pump. Like, Michael Jordan? Right? Who do you think dad would pick? And uh, they would guess, you know, Batman, Superman, maybe MJ. And I would say to them, no, I'd pick you every time. Given the choice, I'd pick you every time. And this was an effort to try to communicate to them that I'm not just willing to be their dad. I want to be their dad. I'm not just willing to be their dad. I want to be their dad. My friends, at one level, this is election. At one level, you and I should be astonished at the reality that he wanted us. Amen? Before we ever wanted him, 
He wanted us. We should stand in awe. It should make us worship. God, thank you. Thank you for extending this gospel call to everyone. So, in the acrostic, everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. Praise God, it goes out to everyone, but it is only effectual. It is only applicable to those who believe. And those who believe should marvel at the truth that God chose them. My friends, this is the gospel. This is the good news that should inspire worship in our hearts. It should also motivate us to share it. Amen? It should motivate us to share it with everyone indiscriminately. For the gospel call goes out to everyone and applicable to those who believe. God, thank you so much for your grace. We are grateful. We are amazed that you would pursue us as you have. We want to worship this morning inside the reality that you chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And it's hard for us to even understand that. But help us, Father, just to marvel at it. Help us to marvel at it this morning. We are so thankful that you, Lord Jesus, came to seek and save the lost. We're happy this morning to be identified with the blind beggar and the crook. Thank you for saving us, not because we were great, but because you are. You are the great physician of the soul. So we thank you, and I pray, God, that you would cause us not only to worship in song, but to worship as we go, looking for people to share it with. I pray that this church would be faithful to share it with everyone, recognizing that you came to seek and save the lost. It's in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. It's in your name that we sing. Amen.